are doing, some of the work that me and my collaborators have been doing, and the context of using unmanned aircraft um, for for research and forecasting. Um, I will say from the outset that, that the term unmanned aircraft has kind of fallen out of favor, um, and, and that the replacements are varied, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but uh, I, I fully admit that I will slip up, and, and as I've done probably three times already, call them unmanned aircraft, but I will try my best to call them unoccupied uh, aircraft uh, or unoccupied aerial vehicles from here on out, but no guarantees that I won't slip up again. I do want to make sure to acknowledge my collaborators. Um, we've had a number of projects over the last decade or so. Um, some of my closest collaborators at the University of Colorado, Brian Argro and Eric Fru in particular, um, but I also have some students that I want to, I'll, I'll mention them as I go along, but uh, Curtis Regante, George Lempert, who's now no longer a student, but a, a research uh, a professor, um, research scientist here, Alex Irwin, Matt Wilson, Kristen Axon, and there's a whole list of, of folks below that, um, that that were instrumental in, in the work that I'm going to present. I'm going to start by defining unoccupied aircraft systems, um, talk a little bit about why, at least in theory, one would use them for severe local storms, uh, talk about some prior applications, um, bias towards the work that we've done, uh, I fully acknowledge that, um, at, for SLS research, but also I'll talk about some active projects that are going on as well, and, and then how we might apply this to severe local storms forecasting and then talk a little bit about next steps in, in both of those arena. So what are unoccupied aircraft systems? Um, ultimately, regardless of what you call them, how you define, the, how you define them is, is the same, that they are reusable, they're unoccupied aircraft, and they're piloted remotely or operating autonomously. Um, they, as I noted, they, they've been called multiple things. Um, unmanned aircraft system is, is the one that was, is probably the most recent that was has been accepted, but again, we've moved away from that. Um, we use the term unoccupied, others use that as well. Others have also used uncrewed, I'm not crazy about the term uncrewed, first of all, it's not even a word, um, but whatever, it's, you, you will find it out there. Um, you also refer, heard them refer to as uh, aerial vehicles, uncrewed, unmanned, unoccupied, or remotely piloted vehicles, RPVs, or, or just drones. Um, it, regardless of what you call them, they take these forms. And these, these five pictures here in front of you capture, to some extent, the, the breadth of, of what these UAS actually are. They could be small handheld things like the, the parrot in the middle. Um, they could be larger things like the, the global hawk here. I'm going to try to grab a pointer and see if I can there we go. Um, the, the, um, sorry, global hawk over here. I mean, this is a commercial aircraft-sized uh, UAS and or Predator. This is an aircraft that I'll talk about in some of my, my work. But so different sizes, of course. But also um, the two main classes are multi-rotor, the, the Parrot and the M600 here versus fixed wing. And I will say that I use both in, in my research, and I will talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages, but if I don't get to it, I can certainly address that in questions. So in theory, why use unmanned aircraft? Oh, sorry, I said that again. <laughs> UAS. Um, it, well, let me first cast the, the problem, which is um, there are knowledge gaps and, and forecasting challenges when it comes to severe local storms. And I don't think I need to dwell too much on this because we know um, severe thunderstorm warnings, as one measure of this, severe thunderstorm warnings are typically pretty good in terms of probability of detection, false alarm rate. They haven't changed a whole lot over the last um, really couple of decades. Um, tornado warnings are a different matter, and and I, I, I'm reluctant to show these kinds of figures, honestly, because I don't want them to be construed as a, a knock against the forecasters. We have the best forecasters in the world, in the United States. I'm fully convinced of that. Um, the problem isn't the quality of the forecaster, it's the quality of the data that go in, the quality of the conceptual models that are used, uh, and that, that leads to what we see in front of us. That is, the, the false alarm rate is almost three quarters and the probability detection is, is too low. And, and I don't think anyone would argue that. So that's the problem um, in terms of forecasting and why, as I noted, we have issues with conceptual models of, of 
supercells and tornadoes. We have um, maybe the data are missing, not maybe, the, there are data gaps as well. In this panel here, in this figure, I talk a little bit about some of the more recent work towards an improved understanding of supercells and tornadoes. And they, they fall into this general class of the way that small scale boundaries and coherent structures might influence tornado formation. Um, there are boundaries that we're all familiar with, the rear flank gust front uh, as one, the forward flank gust front, that those boundaries have been identified long ago, but there are other things that have come in more contemporary research, both through modeling and observations, the left flank vertical vorticity sheet, the um, streamwise vorticity current, um, rear flank internal surge boundaries, all these things fall into this class of smaller scale but still coherent structures and supercells that might be causally related to tornadoes. So the one of the, the statements that kind of that, that motivates a lot of the work that is being done is that significant reductions in false alarm rate could be possible if the meso beta scale, that is we'll call say large scale environmental conditions can be related to the meso gamma scale, the smaller scale processes that ultimately govern when and where a tornado forms. So with that as kind of the, the charge of how we move forward, let me talk a little bit about what UAS can provide. In general, UAS can provide targeted flexible operations when and where data are needed from an unoccupied sensing platform. I mean, in a statement, that's kind of what they do. Um, specifically, they can fly above surface transects and in your storms or across meso gamma scale features so that literally a transect across them can't get that with many other platforms and you certainly can't get that safely with um, any other platforms you can get high fidelity in situ profiling so uh, vertical profiles in close proximity to storms across meso gamma scale structures you can get you can release drop sand sons or drifters from these aircraft um, and you can get simultaneous data collection in multiple mission areas, and that's a, another critical aspect. Another critical capability of UAS is that you can fly multiple UAS in fairly close proximity on certain features to get a more 2D or 3D characterization of that of that phenomenon. And, and how do you apply these? Well, in theory, one can advance understanding using these capabilities. You can uh, directly integrate the data into the forecasting process, give those data to the, in, the in, into the forecaster, to the forecaster. We can assimilate the data into numerical weather prediction models. I'll talk a little bit about all of these as we move forward. So early applications of, of UAS for severe local storms. Again, this is very biased towards the work that we've done, but in fairness, we, me and my collaborators, have been on the leading edge of, of this work. Um, so back in 2009, we um, executed the Coconu Project, Collaborative Colorado-Nebraska UAS experiment. Um, in 2010, we participated in Vortex-2, the second verification of the origins of rotation in tornadoes. And then Vortex-2 is mainly a proof of concept um, type of involvement. Um, we did collect data that were used for research, but for the most part, we, our, our principal accomplishments were just being able to do it, being able to, to operate UAS in supercells. Um, both of these were funded by the National Science Foundation. A lot of our work was or has been uh, the Research and Engineering Center for uh, Unmanned Vehicles, Unoccupied Vehicles at CU has also been heavily involved. So um, let me talk a little bit about Vortex 2. I won't talk much about Coconut, but uh, Vortex 2, again, much larger, a uh, very large project. We were just one small part of it, um, but the we used the the Tempest UAV, a 3.2 meter wingspan fixed wing aircraft. Uh, the major accomplishments were that we were able to do it, frankly. And when I say do it, we were able to get the permissions from the FAA, which was a huge obstacle. Uh, we were able to actually intercept a supercell with the UAS, and we were able to collect data, and this uh, in particular across the rear flank downdraft outflow. Um, you can see the, these polygons here, generally rectangular, I'll talk about, about in just a, a minute, but these were the operations, the yellow and orange squares that we, that we were able to conduct. 
uh, during Vortex 2. Uh, basically, um, this area here, these, these polygons, are where we could operate. We couldn't operate anywhere else within the Vortex 2 domain. Uh, this one is actually, well, you can't see it, but that is actually in a spot where we could, we did have permission to operate. But one of the things we were able to do was use these data for research to advance understanding. Um, and one of my students, Curtis Reganti, uh, led this work as part of his master's research. What we were able to do on June 10th in 2010 uh, in, in Colorado was sample three different air masses, the ambient air mass ahead of a supercell, the rear flank outflow, and this surge behind uh, or within the rear flank outflow. And not only that, but cross these boundaries between these different air masses. And you'll notice in this profile of a time series of equivalent potential temperature, this is the ambient air mass, high, relatively high theta as one would expect. This is the rear flank outflow, relatively low theta but you'll notice that it doesn't stay low. So this is an interesting feature that we were able to observe. And, and as you'll see in the next slide, come up with a, a conceptual model for. And then the theta E drops out. I mean, it's it very cold, um, very dry theta E uh, or air mass in, in C back behind this surge. Okay, so what, what we're able to do with the, these data is develop this conceptualization of what might this might actually um, be doing. Essentially, what, what caused this high theta E air to exist within the cold outflow. This is a cross-section, clearly a cartoon, but um, essentially what we hypothesize is that air from the ahead of the rear flank gusher and ahead of the supercell was entrained into this uh, turbulent wake behind the, the head of the, the uh, outflow, the head of the density current, which yielded high theta E within this air mass. And then not only that, but the process of entraining this air into the air mass, this cooler air mass, originally cooler air mass, uh, resulted in entrainment of momentum, which caused kinematic frontogenesis and yielded the, the surge, yielded this boundary within the outflow that has been, in other cases, associated with uh, and hypoth hypothesized to be a cause of tornado genesis. As I noted, we're not the only ones doing severe local storms work with unmanned aircraft, unoccupied aircraft. Um, Joe Sion at, at NOAA has been flying UAS and hurricanes for, for a number of years, uh, has a paper out in 2020 that describes this work. Sue Vandenheber at CSU has been working with UAS. They used uh, rotary wing UAS to sample outflows associated with supercells. So you know, we're not the only ones doing it. I, wanted to give credit where credit is due. There is other work that's being done. In terms of active research, I'm going to talk about a few projects that um, my students, for the most part, are leading, uh, one of which was associated with a field campaign that occurred in southern Colorado uh, in the San Luis Valley. So this is Colorado, um, this is south, south Central. Um, the, the experiment occurred in South Central Colorado. The San Luis Valley is a valley. Um, a high mountain valley surrounded by mountains. And the reason we chose this as a, a location for this field experiment is you'll see from this Google map um, image that there's irrigated region and a non-irrigated region within this one high mountain valley. And so it served as a, a good laboratory for exploring the potential impact of irrigation on the atmosphere. Um, one that has been explored by others, we're certainly not the first to do so, but what, what, we're, what we were bringing to the table that was innovative is a ton of unmanned, ton of unoccupied aircraft. Um, and what we did was coordinate the operations to focus on drainage flow, that is flow out of uh, high mountain valleys, um, the processes responsible for boundary layer evolution from you know the diurnal evolution, and also deep convection. And that's what my student Alex Irwin uh, did uh, focused on for his master's research. So these are the locations of UAS that were operating, plus for some surface stations. He used these data, which are unique because we were operating these UAS very frequently. Um, this is an example from the OU Copter Sonde. OU was one of the uh, institutions involved in the Lapsurate project. 
these are flights every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes up to 3,000 feet uh, above ground level. You could do that with the sounding system, but you probably couldn't do that at 10 sites this frequent with the sounding system. So this really is a capability that UAS provide that is, that is unique. And so what he did with this is he looked at the differences in convective indices between the irrigated and non-irrigated regions. So you, this is a, uh, a different visualization. And this is, a, I think, in, in DVI, you can see that there's clearly an irrigated region surrounded by non-irrigated. There were sites, there were aircraft that were operating in the non-irrigated, air, aircraft operating in the irrigated. And it was on a day where deep convection formed. And so what he did was he looked at, uh, he took a, a reference sounding, a single sounding, for the entire valley, which we'd assume that above uh, the planetary boundary layer probably is virtually unchanged across this 50 kilometer or so valley, but then modified that sounding based on either surface observations, that's this top table, or observations from the aircraft. And the, the pattern that he identified was pretty interesting in, in that if you just look at surface-based modif modifications to these soundings. That is, you can think of this as just like an ASOS station, but you have a sounding and you modify it, you look at the CAPE, and the SEN, and the LFC, this suggests that the irrigated region is more favorable than the non-irrigated. The CAPE is higher, the SEN is lower, the LFC height is lower as well. But when you look at the, the UAS-based modifications, that is over a, 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 a layer, a deep layer, or deepish layer, and the planetary boundary layer, the picture changes. Now the non-irrigated is more favorable, generally. Um, higher cape, lower sun. This is particularly interesting because it suggests that surface-based observations alone are insufficient. It suggests that the possibly, and we don't know for sure, but possibly the irrigated region would be less favorable than the non-irrigated region for CI, from convection initiation. And much more needs to be done. This is not a complete picture of CI, but it does suggest, number one, a process. That is, that the, the deeper layers uh, of the planetary boundary layer are impacted or impact the probability of CI more than just the surface modification by the, the land surface. Number two, if, as we look towards how we might incorporate UAS into forecasting, and this is, this is fundamental understanding, but if, if we think about how we can use UAS for, for improved forecasting, um, it, it makes a, a bit more of a compelling case that um, adding surface observations are good, but you do need that vertical profile um, to, to contribute at least to, to deep convection forecasting. So um, lab trait was back in, in 2018. Uh, the Taurus project is something that um, the University of Nebraska is leading along with CU, Texas Tech, uh, National Severe Storms Lab. It's uh, a reasonably ambitious, reasonably, reasonably large field campaign um, focused on understanding supercells and tornadoes. Uh, TORUS stands for Targeted Observation by Radars and UAS of Supercells. Um, the focus of TORUS is to close fundamental knowledge gaps. It is a, a focus on fundamental understanding. Um, uh, specifically those that those those knowledge gaps that relate to storm generated boundaries and coherent structures within supercell thunderstorm outflow and how those might relate back to the generation or amplification of near surface rotation so those boundaries that and, and structures that I've mentioned before the rear flank internal surge the left flank vertical vorticity sheet the streamwise vorticity current these things are the focus of Taurus. It's funded by National Science Foundation and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, it's, a, it's a reasonably large field campaign. We don't chat, just have UAS. Uh, the UAS that we used are down here. I'll have a, a zoomed in view of those in just a minute. Um, it's using multiple platforms. And the, the point here is that with this suite of platforms, we can conduct coordinated and highly focused deployments um, tasked with collecting thermodynamic and kinematic observations both aloft and at the surface to expose the role that these coherent structures and boundaries might play in, in supercell, supercells and tornadoes.
here are some of the other platforms besides the UAS that were used, mobile radars, mobile mesnets, mobile sounding systems, winds on system, LIDAR, and of course the P3, the uh, NOAA P3 is involved in Taurus. Um, they have the, the P3 has a, a dual tail radar so that we get storm scale um, radar um, for, for the cases that we, that we, uh, we deploy on. Um, so the UAS that we use is the Raven. Um, it's, you can see the picture here on the right, uh, it's a foam construction. It's very lightweight. Um, it has a big fuselage, maybe hard to see, but this guy here can hold a number of batteries, which is good. Um, and of course the, the main, the, I can't think of what the word is, the logger, there we go, the logger, um, the, um, all the instrumentation that one would need to collect the observations, but also to operate the aircraft um, without a person on board. So um, there's an autopilot, um, so it's it's flying semi-autonomously. Um, we, we don't just release the aircraft into the storm. It, it'd be nice if we could do that uh, to some extent, but um, it actually is tasked to follow a GPS location of a surface-based vehicle. So it's on autopilot, but it's following the a, a ground-based vehicle. The problem, of course, with that is that we can't necessarily divorce the observations that we're collecting above the ground from a person, right? We can't just wherever we drive it goes so if we drive into hail um you know we, we, we the people are, are of course at risk but um but the the benefit of this is that we have a a, a data point above the ground which is um we hypothesize is really important um the other thing that we we can get with the the, the aircraft is um you can't get with a manned aircraft besides the fact that there's nobody in the actual aircraft is that you can have multiple aircraft operating in the same airspace so you can get two aircraft flying in a stack formation above a ground-based vehicle and, and get a, a essentially a moving tower that we can operate in in the storm um one of the innovations that cu uh, developed was a, a catapult launching system called pneumatic catapult um, you can see in this video hopefully it's coming through clearly um, it's on top of a Ford Explorer so we drive in, into the storm and launch the aircraft it it's a game changer in terms of our flexibility for launching so where did we operate well we operated in uh, the central, central part of the US where Climatologically, we would expect supercells and tornadoes um, in the May and June timeframe. For comparison, this is the domain that we operated in Vortex 2, where we had permission to operate um, in, back in 2010. Obviously, we have a much larger area, um, over a million square kilometers now, compared to what we had back in Vortex 2. So the, the basic approach for the UAS component of Taurus actually for for all the platforms not just the UAS component it is to break the storm into these four um, regions the left flank which is just north of the mesocyclone um, just north of where the tornado would form the right flank which is just south of where the meso or the mesocyclone where the tornado would form and associate with the in the region where you find the rear flank gust front the near inflow so within 15 or 20 kilometers of the storm and the far inflow. And within each of these regions, we have all of the assets deployed. We have UAS and three of these, left flank, right flank, and near inflow. We have soundings from near inflow and far inflow. The P3 is operating about 10 kilometers in front of the storm, so kind of in the near inflow. We have radars distributed uh, in, the, in those um, regions as well. So we were able to go out in 2019. Um, that was our first field season. Um, we were able to conduct oper coordinated oper observations on 17 supercells, seven of which were tornadic. We had two pre-convective missions, um, a total of 14 deployment days. We were able to fly 51 UAS missions on 15 supercells, totaling 115, sorry, 40.85 flight hours. The P3 had 115 flight hours. And you can see the, the distribution of our deployments. Um, maybe it's a little difficult to see the state boundaries, but and this is Kansas, this is southern Nebraska, eastern Colorado. 2019, as most people probably know, was an odd year. Um, we didn't operate at all north of I-80. 
uh, even though we were operating as late as June 15th. Um, as I said, seven of them were tornadic. Several of them produced um, damage, I mean, EF1, EF2 damage. Um, and we were distributed across um, you know, the mainly the western and southern part of, of our operation domain. So I'm going to talk a, little, talk a little bit about some of the research that's being done with the Taurus data. And caveat is that this is research in my research group. So this is not research being done um, at Texas Tech or at National Severe Storms Lab. Um, that is, that research is significant, and I don't want to downplay it by focusing just on the research that the University of Nebraska is doing. Um, but I wanted to focus uh, a lot on where UAS are being used for, for our research. And one of the cases that we're focusing on, uh, this is Kristen Axon's work. Kristen is a MS student. Um, she is focusing on the 28th May Tipton, Kansas supercell and tornado. And this event was characterized by uh, two supercells, one to the north, one to the south. The southern supercell is the one that produced uh, a tornado. Uh, I think it was EF2. Um, the deployment, which of course passed pretty quickly, um, deployment summary, but um, showed all of our assets going into the storm. But what was interesting about this case is that there was a pre-existing air mass boundary, and it shows up pretty well on the NOXP data uh, ahead of the storm. And so you can use, and we did use, the UAS as well as the surface observations to characterize the thermodynamics and kinematics of the uh, across this boundary. Uh, this is uh, the height of the aircraft as it operated, uh, the path. Um, this is theta e. We'll talk a little bit, a lot about this because you can use those data to produce plots that are probably more familiar, a skew t log p diagram, or the difference between these pairs of traces, the red temperature green dew point is that this is from the UAS that was on the north side of the pre-existing boundary and the lighter ones are on the south side of the boundary. Uh, the winds are also illustrated here and, and what is interesting about the this air mass that was on the north side of uh, this pre-existing boundary was that it had higher theta e even though it was colder. It was, it's clearly colder in this north side air mass but it has higher theta e, which is interesting because what that meant is that the cape was higher. The cape was actually higher on the cool side of this air mass boundary, uh, and by you know, 300-ish joules per kilogram. Not only that, but because the winds were considerably more backed uh, from the east northeast on the north side of the boundary, the wind shear was considerably larger. In fact, 50% larger. The zero to six uh, kilometer bulk wind shear was 50% larger on the cool side. Of the boundary. Now, this this type of air mass, the, this mesoscale air mass with high theta, is something that a student of mine uh, and I uh, examined. Um, not for this case, but for another case. These are interesting, obviously, because it's cooler and yet higher theta and higher k. But this appears that it it very likely was a mat. Not only did it have thermodynamic and kinematic characteristics. Um, that might be more favorable, but also this is a pre-existing boundary sampled by the mobile LIDAR. It had vertical motion associated with it. And so the combination of favorable thermodynamics, higher cape, um, favorable kinematics, particularly um, the vertical shear, and localized vertical motion um, suggests that maybe this boundary was important for the storm, and that's one of the things that Kristen is looking at. Another one of the cases that was that we examined or that we uh, uh, data that we collected was the June 8th case near Goodland. Again, this is all in 2019, and this is a, a case that was interesting because two supercells formed. The first supercell, the earlier supercell we sampled, uh, did not last very long. I mean, it, it died pretty quickly. Um, the second supercell, which will come up in a minute, um, developed. In about the same location, certainly passed over the same areas. Um, yet, as you'll see in the in the this animation, looked very different. Uh, not only did it have a uh, much more prominent reflectivity signature, but it also produced tornadoes. Uh, in, co in contrast to the the first one, and so one of my st my PhD students, Matt Wilson, is looking at this case. He's doing a case study of it um, to 
in an effort to understand what was different in the environment that led to one supercell to become considerably stronger and tornadic than uh, the, the previous storm. But the other thing that he's doing is he's using this case as a way to explore the potential impact of near storm data on numerical weather prediction. So you may be familiar with this, pro this, this concept, worn on forecasting. It's, it's something that the National Severe Storms Lab has been working on for a number of years. And the idea is that at some point in the near future, numerical weather prediction models may be used for the issuance of warnings. Uh, that means they have to be very high resolution, very small, capturing very small scale structures. And one of the limitations on the accuracy of these, these, uh, this numerical weather prediction guidance is the initial data. To get high resolution and accurate um, simulations, you need high resolution and accurate observations. And so what he's planning to do is to conduct what's called a data denial set of experiments. Essentially what he will do is he'll assimilate initial conditions into uh, a suite of numerical weather prediction model or uh, simulations um, and hold back certain bits of data in each experiment. So for example, in the first experiment that he'll conduct, he'll use the conventional observations and radar, which is typical. And then the next experiments, he will uh, include the, the supplementary observations collected as part of TORUS. So in addition to conventional OBS and radar, he'll use surface observations, planetary boundary layer observations, and free atmosphere observations that TORUS collected. And then he'll hold back parts of those to see which of these is most impactful, at least for this one particular storm. And the hypothesis is that um, all of these data may be impactful, that is all of the supplementary data may be impactful and that perhaps the planetary boundary layer data may be the most impactful. It'd be consistent with some of the work that Alex Irwin and others have done, um, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what, um, how the accuracy of the predictions change as these new uh, unconventional supplementary data are uh, assimilated. And so this is a good segue into how UAS might be used for severe local storms forecasting. Most of the work well, all the work that I've discussed so far is focused on fundamental research, but, um, and particularly with some of the work that Matt is doing, there's a, a nod towards forecasting, how these data might be influential, might be impactful for actual forecasting. And so I start off with just a vision for the future. Um, it's one, probably of many visions, but here's the way UAS might be used in the future for forecasting. Uh, there might be a, a, a flock of UAS that are distributed across the central United States that could be scrambled to a particular location where severe thunderstorms might form, uh, you know, uh, enhanced risk of, of severe storms or tornadoes. And they would collect data that could be used by forecasters, that could be used by, uh, it could be assimilated in numerical weather prediction models. And then as storms form, they could be retasked to get um, different types of data, near storm, far field, whatever. Aircraft, uh, U.S. could be used um, to basically modify, modernize the, the meteorological surveillance network. So instead of just ASOS stations collecting surface observations, there could be these UAS that are profiling, and they're profiling you know, every 30 minutes, every hour, and essentially getting what Phil Chilson at, at OU has coined a, a 3D mesonet. Um, so you get a, a three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere. And they're not targeted, they're not going to storms, or but they're just profiling and, and collecting data um, in, a, in a spatially dense and temporally dense way. Um, you could put radars on UAS and deploy them into storms to, to do gap-filling radars, or you could have them drop drop sons or deploy drifters. I mean, there are a whole suite of things that UAS could do uh, to improve the data that forecasters have access to and improve the data that numeric weather prediction models have access to. But before we do that, we need to answer a couple of basic questions. And these aren't the only questions that need to be answered, but um, they're important ones. What data do forecasters really need to improve their forecasting? We can develop a, a sophisticated mousetrap, but does the mousetrap actually work? Um, in which locations are data most impactful to numeric weather prediction? Again, we could cover the United States with a 3D mesonet, which would be fantastic, but the reality is we're probably not going to have that capability. We're probably going to have to be more 
deliberate about where data are collected. So uh, as part of an answer to that first question, what data do forecasters need, we conducted a nationwide survey of National Weather Service forecasters. This, uh, the paper is now in an early online uh, release, um, so you have, can access it now, and it will be coming out in, in BAMS shortly. Um, but what we wanted to do was ask the questions, which phenomena are difficult to forecast owing to data gaps? Which characteristics need to be observed to fill these data gaps? And what role might UAS play in filling these gaps? And it's important to note, the first two questions are platform agnostic. We didn't ask, how can UAS fill data gaps to start off with? We just said, what are the data gaps? What data gaps are, 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 are there that compromise your ability to forecast accurately? And what characteristics do you need to fill those gaps? And then had forecasters discuss what they thought UAS might be able to, to do to fill those gaps. Uh, we had a great response, uh, 630 forecasters who responded and distributed across the entire United States. Um, you can see the, it was the response rate was really good, about 30%. We also had forecasters from national facilities like uh, the Storm Prediction Center respond. Um, so this is kind of a dense graphic, but uh, it, it, it's a summary of, of that, the, the answer to the question, what phenomena are difficult to forecast? And uh, draw your attention to the check marks, because these are the specific phenomena that forecasters found the frequently um, uh, had gaps and, and that needed to be filled to improve forecasting. Uh, flooding, winter precipitation, blowing dust, icing, um, turbulent visibility. Um, we um, analyzed the data in a slightly different way and said, so of those forecasters that often forecast these phenomena, not just all forecasters, but of those forecasters that often forecast, how do they feel gaps are important? I mean, we, it would make sense that we focus on the often forecasters because those are the ones that are the most experienced forecasting those particular phenomena. And the picture doesn't change a whole lot. Flooding is there. Uh, winter precipitation, either lake and effect, lake enhanced snow, um, air quality, icing, wind, non-thunderstorm winds, they're, they're all there. It, it, it is interesting that if you look across these, what um, forecasters don't feel um, are affected by gaps. If you look at all forecasters, hurricanes don't really fall into that category. Um, if you look at the often forecasters, they're kind of neither frequent nor infrequent. Uh, extreme temperature, same thing. Um, but the next question was, all right, so we have these gaps. What, what characteristics need to be observed to actually fill those gaps? And again, it's kind of a dense plot there on the left, but I'll draw your attention to the table. Um, based on the, the mean priority, I mean, uh, what um, they were asked to get prioritized these or, or um, assess their importance, uh, number one, temperature profile and mixed precipitation, clearly a winter precipitation. Um, uh, characteristic. A hydrometeor type, again, in winter. Radar gaps, vertical uh, near storm, vertical wind profiles, ground conditions for flooding, snow accumulation, wind shear of the pre-convective environment, wildfires, nocturnal thunderstorms, and storm damage. Now, again, those first few questions were that led to the, that analysis had nothing to do with UAS. But we also wanted to ask that question. What, you, what would you see as UAS, uh, what characteristics of UAS, what uh, operational modality, what, let's talk, we wanted them to talk to uh, what UAS might be able to do. And so in terms of the important capabilities or characteristics of UAS, um, they did find that the regulation specifically for forecasting, National Weather Service used for forecasting, were important. Um, and the assumption there is that it's FAA regulations that are important. Being able to integrate data into their, uh, their system, uh, to be able to put it into context with other data that they have available. Um, most of them wanted, or a lot of them wanted the UAS to be equipped with a camera. Uh, they wanted the data in real time, probably not surprising, and they wanted it on demand. They wanted to be able to have the data collected where they needed it, not just in real, getting it in real time, but where they actually needed it. Another thing that was interesting about this is that we gave them three choices for operation modes. And the three choices were targeted surveillance, that is, the aircraft could go wherever, collect the data that were needed, and send those data back. Um, they could 
be at fixed sites, just profiling, fixed site profiling, or they could be at fixed sites but running transects between sites. And of those three, targeted surveillance turned out to be the most important. And that could be for a lot of reasons. Um, that's not to say that a 3D mesonet of fixed site profiling would be valuable, but I think forecasters responded to the on-demand capability of targeted surveillance and responded accordingly. So in terms of kind of some takeaways from that survey, and besides just the, the, you know, the analysis, the raw numbers that came out, radar gaps are clearly important. Um, that, that came out of the focus groups that we conducted ahead of the, the survey as well, which is not terribly surprising, but it presents a pretty significant engineering challenge. To be able to operate radars on particularly small UAS is, it would be challenging. Environmental conditions and winter precipitation are highly valued. That was very clear. Um, but the you know, problem with operating a UAS, any aircraft in winter precipitation, is icing. And so that would that's a technological an engineering problem that would need to be addressed. Targeted surveillance is a preferred mode of operation, but operating aircraft in that capacity, being able to send it beyond visual line of sight to go target a particular feature, collect data in a particular area, it necessitates some te technological and regulatory um, innovations. Now, most of that focus was on just the raw data. I mean, obviously in, in a format that, that forecasters could use, but not filtered through a numeric weather prediction model. Uh, the forecasters would have access to the data um, in, in its raw form. Um, but as I noted before, the data collected by UAS could also be used for numerical weather prediction. And there are a couple of ways, a few ways this could be done. Um, they could be, these data could be assimilated uh, either through targeted observations or a modernized surveillance network, a 3D mesonet concept, where those data are assimilated into a model, or the observations could be used to subset or weight an ensemble of numerical weather prediction forecasts. So um, as you probably know, the numerical weather prediction models are run, a lot of them are run as ensembles. So they're tweaked in a perturbed in a slightly different way, and you get a a collection of runs that you can use to assess the probabilistic, um, uh, make, make probabilistic forecasts. So if a lot of the ensemble members are forecasting a particular solution, there's confidence in that solution being probably correct. Uh, similarly, if there was a lot of variance, that is um, a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot of variability in a particular solution that lends um, a little less confidence to, to that solution. So what one could do is use observations to filter out particular ensemble members and then subset them. This set of ensemble members is more likely because the observations that are, have been collected, either targeted or otherwise, suggest that that ensemble member is, is more accurate. And that's not a, not a new idea. That's an idea, not even an idea that that I have come up with this is something that others have, have demonstrated um, as a way of using observations to improve numerical weather prediction without actually assimilating the data into the model. So in terms of assimilation, as I noted, uh, Matt Wilson's work uh, from Taurus, but there's also a, a paper that's come out fairly recently led, recently led by Andrew Jensen where they used the lapse rate data. Um, and the lapse rate data focused um, on drainage flow, flow out of the valleys. Um, and asked the question whether UAS data improved the forecast once these data were assimilated. And the, the short answer is yes. Uh, using UAS improved the forecast of drainage flow. And you can get a sense for that improvement in the right panels here. The orange-ish trace time series is when UAS data have been assimilated. Uh, the grayish trace is the actual observation. So you would want the forecast to be close to that. And when there is no data simulation of UAS data, there is a gap between the, the actual observations and the forecast. In other words, UAS data improve the accuracy. And that can be seen in temperature, can be seen in relative humidity, and winds as well. So the takeaway, and these are forecasts. This is not observations. That is, 
it, this isn't a comparison of the observations to observations that have included UAS. This is an actual free forecast, and it shows that numerical, numerical weather prediction guidance is more accurate when UAS data are incorporated, assimilated, at least for this particular phenomenon, drainage flow. They're also using these data um, for with the, the lab trade data for an examination of the accuracy of convection initiation forecasts. This is work that's in prep, um, and so this is not out yet, but the, the takeaway from this is similar. That is, once UAS data have been assimilated into a numerical weather prediction model, the forecasts of convection initiation are improved. And if we look over here, this is the colored shading is the probability from um, all of the ensemble members. The probability on the left panels when there is no UAS data assimilated is not particularly high where precipitation actually occurred. These pink contours where precipitation actually occurred. But when UAS data are assimilated, the probability of precipitation is high where precipitation actually occurred. So again, UAS data appear to improve the forecast. Okay, so next steps. What are the next steps? Well, Taurus, um, we had a deployment in 2019. We we're planning to go out in 2020. Um, COVID changed that. We plan to go out in 2021. COVID changed that. So we are going to go out in 22, at least I hope. Um, the, the, that's our second and our last field season. Um, using the UAS, using all those all those other platforms. Again, focused on improving a fundamental understanding of supercells and tornadoes. Um, a couple of things that have changed with regard to UAS for Taurus, we have a larger operations area. We now have North Dakota and um, a little bit more of New Mexico, uh, East New Mexico and Southeastern Colorado. So the domain has uh, expanded. We have larger NOTAMs. NOTAMs are an FAA thing, a notice to airmen. Essentially, it tells general aviation aircraft that we are operating in a particular area. They have to be issued just ahead of our operations. Well, we now have larger areas so we can map out a bigger space. We have a new PTH housing for the Raven. You can kind of see it here. It's in a different location, a much better location. So we hope that'll improve the accuracy of the PTH data that are, uh, sorry, pressure, temperature, humidity data that are collected. We'll have two UAS in the left flank region instead of just one as we did in 2019. And the other thing that's, that we're working on is uh, distributing the data in real time to the National Weather Service. And that is a, a project that um, I'm pursuing with some folks here at, at uh, UNL. Um, and the hope is that all of the National Weather Service forecast offices might have access to a, a, a subset of the data that we collect in Taurus in real time. And so if you're a forecaster, uh, uh, you might see these data um, uh, for, for next spring. And the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, I'm not going to talk much about it, it's a new grant that, that just came in, starts in, in January of 2022, led by University of Colorado. Um, the name probably doesn't reveal much about it, but it's basically using UAS for targeted surveillance to see if we can improve numerical weather prediction. So some of those concepts that I've been, that, that I've been discussing where we actually have funding from the National Science Foundation to um, continue that effort. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Um, here's some of the, our social media presence, both my research group and, and Taurus, um, and some eye candy. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Houston. Very, very interesting. That was an excellent talk. Um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Houston, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, if you're having trouble doing that, um, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll try to fix it. I have a feeling that people are stuck muted for some reason.
Give me one second to make sure anyone who wants to ask. I see some people are muted by me for some reason. I'm going to try to fix that. I think I got most people. Oh, is there a question? No. Sorry, I'm talking to myself here. <laughs> um, I right, guess not hearing any questions. Thank you for your time and everything. Um, this is a fascinating talk. Uh, kind of neat the way that we can try to fill these holes in the data because I know, especially out here on the plains, it's even our conventional data sources are pretty spread out and there's a lot of holes in them anyway. So. Um, it's great to hear. And actually, that supercell event over Goodland, I, I was one of the people working that day. I remember we got some reports from the, the plane because the uh, supercell was actually forming right on top of town, and we couldn't hardly see anything with our radar. Um, so that was it's kind of an interesting event. It'll be interesting to see what the, his modeling sensitivity study has on that. Yeah. Hey, Jer Jeremy, I have a quick question. This is John in North Platte. Oh, go ahead, John. Hey, uh, thanks again for the talk, Dr. Houston. Uh, really fascinating. Um, to see what kind of things are out in field projects. Um, looking forward to seeing some of the data in real time. That'd be awesome. Hey, I'm just curious. It looks like you're going to have a, a second uh, drone location in the left flank area. What, what do you hope to gain from a second one uh, as opposed to what was done earlier in Taurus? Yeah, um, the, the, the main... The main goal for that second aircraft is to add another, simply, simply add another data point to try to get closer to a 2D representation, um, or 3D if you include time, of the air masses that we encounter and the boundaries that we encounter. Um, it, it, asks, it also add, affords us another point for redundancy. I mean, should we have data issues with that aircraft? But mainly, it's it's just to add an, another point. Um, I mean, with two two data points with the aircraft and the surface measurements from the, the mobile mesonet, those are good. You can approximate some of the, the um, variation, you know, the lapse rate, whatever. But, um, you know, that, that third point is is, a, is important. And plus, as you, the, the other thing you can do with these aircraft, and um, I didn't visualize it quite well, but to the extent that you can assume um, a, a measure of, of um, continuity, in the evolution of the storm, if you fly the aircraft at two heights and then drop them down and fly them at another two heights, essentially now you have four points aloft and one point at the surface. And so now you're getting a pretty dense representation of the vertical profile of temperature, moisture, and winds. Um, and so you really start filling in some of those gaps. All right, excellent. I'm yeah, looking forward to what comes out of that. I know you know, a lot of research um, kind of looking at the SVC versus what comes out of colder, you know, into the forward flank region and what what makes it into the tornado seed and what contributes to the low level as a cyclone. Hopefully some of that can kind of be borne out in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, John. Yeah, and then the, to the extent that we can relate some of these, this understanding of the small scale to the larger scale, which are represented um, reliably, you know, without having to modify the, uh, the meteorological surveillance network. Um, I think that would really improve forecasting. Excellent. This is Aaron Thanks Johnson. Again. Appreciate it. Yep. Sorry about that. This, this is Aaron Johnson, the Sioux at Dodge City. I was Aaron. curious, um, kind of building off of John's conversation topic there with Ford Flank, how well does the UAS handle hail? Because it's one thing to fly right along the, the forward flank gust front. Maybe you're sampling the, that SVC near that forward flank convergence boundary. But when you dig deeper into the left flank convergence boundary region, it seems like you're going to start encountering larger hydrometeors. I was just curious how, how you handle that or how they handle that. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and the answer is surprisingly well. Um, we didn't expect that it would be able to do well in, in hail, and in 2019 we encountered it, and it did fine. And there's no guarantee. I mean, a, a, a hailstone that catches the prop just wrong 
um, we'll take the aircraft out of the sky. But we we were in um, about one inch hail for about 10 minutes in on the 27th of May, and actually in Southwest Nebraska, and um, it we did fine. Um, so you know you you start talking about golf balls and baseballs. That's a different matter. Um, we we can't be we can't be too gung ho, uh, too cavalier about getting into those parts of the storm. But um, the reality is that we need to be in that precipitation. I mean that that has become fairly clear, and and the and the results that we have seen so far um, is that you know the SVC sets up along the precipitation boundary. It doesn't necessarily fit uh, set up in in clear air, and some of those boundaries that are important. Uh, with the exception of the forward flank gust front, perhaps, those boundaries are setting up on the precipitation gradients. And so we need to be able to get into that precipitation. And we did in, in 2019. Um, and so we have confidence that they'll be okay. But um, yeah, it, we're, gonna, we're probably going to lose an aircraft at, at some point. That's not our intent. Um, you know, we're, they're not free. But they're also not you know, fifty thousand dollars, and more importantly, there's no person inside of it, and so um, we we have that that flexibility that you wouldn't have with a manned aircraft. All right, yeah, very good. I I just figured as you know we're moving kind of beyond what's going on with the SVC and digging deeper into the storm, or assumed we were going to start encountering that more. And uh, interesting area. I guess you realize we may lose a, a craft or two, but. Uh, the science are probably pretty amazing, even if it's lost. So thank you yeah. very much. You bet. Thank you. All right, one last call for any questions. Hey, this is uh, Roger down at Wichita. <clears throat> Hey, uh, Dr. Houston, I, like others, I yeah, really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, it was neat uh, working in 2019 and, and getting some of the data that y'all had uh, that year. I, I believe we used some of that, um, uh, some of the information just in our operations that year, so that was neat. Um, and this is kind of a, I don't know if it's easy to pick one, but if you could pick just in, in from your personal side, like um, if, if you could pick one thing that, that you're most excited about uh, with, with this research and, and where that could eventually work into operations. Um, again, I know that there's probably more than just one, but is there maybe one thing that, that gets you most excited personally for um, what's been coming out of the research and, and, and what uh, you hope to be able to mix into operations eventually? Yeah, in terms of the R2O, I think what's most exciting to me is the prospect of using UAS in reliably in the field, uh, reliably for forecasting. Um, that is, can we modernize the meteorological surveillance network with UAS? I, I don't know how it's going to look. Um, I don't think anyone does. But that's a, a really interesting and important question. Um, and there's a lot to that, as I noted. I mean, you know, what data do you really need? I mean, we can't just can't just throw data, you know, invest billions of dollars and throw data at you and just hope the magic happens. I mean, it needs to be more deliberate than that. But I, I th Taurus is is focused on fundamental research, but the technology that we're using, the technology that we're developing, and some of the insights that we get from the research will inform how this might happen in the future. And um, it, the other thing that that I, I try to emphasize is that. There's a lot of focus on on how the, the impact of the data on numerical weather prediction, and I think that there's a lot of value in that. Uh, but the, the forecasters could use the data without it being filtered through a model first, and that, that's com that's been clear in my discussions, and that's been just clear in the national survey. And so, while the the motivation for using UAS may partly be how the the impact on numerical weather prediction, I, we cannot ignore that those data in and of themselves introduced in the into the workflow of a forecaster may improve forecasts. Okay, great. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, great stuff. Thank you. Thanks. Great questions. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Houston, um, for your talk and, and for your willingness to help us out.